All right, I'm Michael Mitchell, and I'm presenting uh, Context and Bioware Applications for Android. Uh, this is largely a uh, combination of a few different projects that I'm working on, and this is uh, how I have uh, managed to put them all together under one unified framework. So, uh, start with some research questions. Uh, largely, this is trying to develop a mobile system uh, that, that can determine the context of the surroundings of the user, uh, using only the sensors, web services, and social media. And uh, assuming that we can create such a system, the next, uh, the next question is clearly going to be, what can we use, use this data for? So what additional uh, context and bioware applications can we create using this contextual data that we have derived from our surroundings? OK, so start, uh, move on to some own, uh, a little bit of terminology, because uh, these are mostly words that I have made up, I guess. Uh, context, uh, what I mean by context is the actual data that we can collect from the sensors and the web services and media that will collectively determine what the user is doing. Where their surroundings are, etc. Uh, I don't mean the Android dot content content got context. Uh, this is also not application context. I'm not really concerned about uh, what state an application is running in. Uh, things like context switch are not that kind of context. Uh, next term is context provider, which is kind of what I'm tentatively calling this. Uh, I'm extending on the Android content provider uh, to allow a unified queryable repository for all of this content information that we're collecting. Uh, context aware, this is a term I made up to uh, denote app Android applications that are able to use this kind of resource as a context aware application. Uh, bio aware are applications that uh, use the context aware framework and additionally use biosensors to add additional uh, context data. Uh, BEAT, the bio environment Android tracking, this is a medical monitoring and alert framework that Frank and I developed. Uh, we presented it. Uh, in January at uh, the IEEE Radio Wireless Conference in Phoenix. Also, Temper Chainer, this is another project working on. It's a uh, biofeedback driven music recommendation system. Uh, it basically uses your heart rate to guide your music selection. So, kind of a clever mashup of some of these technologies. We'll talk about this. Okay, sensor fusion. This is uh, where a lot of this stuff actually kind of comes from. Uh, this is a term that's usually used to define uh, taking multiple individual sensors and combining them into more useful higher level sensors. Uh, this can also be done with levels of sensors so you can merge multiple higher level sensors into other ones and you know, get more useful information from these devices and sensors. Uh, some examples that you will always see are things like network location and GPS location. These are two different ways that we can determine where we are on the phone and combining multiple of them together will help cancel out some of the uh, inadequacies that uh, each individual sensors have. So for example, uh, accelerometers and compasses gyroscopes, uh, a lot of times if you're using an accelerometer, uh, the movement won't be smooth, you'll have a lot of peaks, uh, just because of the nature of the technology. And when you combine multiples of these together, uh, you can uh, eliminate a lot of the, uh, uh, the false readings that are associated with something and get better data from it. So that's kind of where this all came from. Uh, where it so uh, some context examples that we can actually are looking to drive to. <laughs> things like movement, whether you're walking, running, or driving, uh, because these are all going to mean different things and in different contexts. Also local environments, since we're using the weather, depending on, uh, depending on environmental conditions, we're going to do different things. Uh, time of day, time of the week, also things like holidays. Uh, these all mean different things in terms of what your phone is, what you are doing, and where you are. Uh, locations, how close you are to home, how close you are to work, whether you're traveling or uh, news headlines, stock prices, things that you care about, uh, or did you, you know, even moving into social events, did you, did you break up with your girlfriend on Facebook? Uh, these are all things that context that we're trying to track and collectively determine. Yes. So I, I see, I'm, I'm seeing two different kinds of things here. One, one is uh, essentially context data that just exists because you're in the world, but others, I think the value of the meaning of the context data, like news headlines or stock prices, are, are can, I guess there's, I guess they're configurable. It depends on what you want. Is there? Do you distinguish between those two kind of things, like stuff that has sort of input from the user versus stuff that well, it'll just exist for being there? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, this kind of came from two different sides on it. It's okay. more, of a, more of an event automation kind of thing, and more of a kind of a query repository. So the event automation would be more like uh, have my phone. It's it's uh, at this point in time calendar. I'm in class, so I want my phone to automatically turn itself off. You know, turn right. the ringer off. Um, so the event-based stuff kind of is okay. there, and it's really uh, kind of how we're, how we're trying to connect them together. Uh, uh, on a, to conclude here, uh, even things like health and mood, uh, some of the stuff we've been looking at are things like how many times you hit the snooze button that morning, maybe you're hmm. more likely to be sick, unscheduled stops at, uh, at uh, drugstores, 
Let me tell you how many beers you drank last night. Exactly. You're a, you're a, you're a, you don't usually go out, but the PS says you're somewhere. Yeah, okay, yeah absolutely. Okay, um, so how do we actually determine this? Uh, largely, there's four kind of ways to do so. It's uh, pulling and receiving events from the sensors. These are things just like uh, accelerometers and compass and ambient light and even uh, ambient background noise. Uh, also, web services for downloading content. Uh, a lot of web services there. We've only really scratched the surface of what all we can actually get from uh, just from the web. Uh, also, Android system events. There's uh, uh, intent gets fired all over the place anytime the system does anything. We just made a listener for all of them, so it's pretty easy to track those. And then also user interaction. Uh, how, how recently the user was using the phone. Uh, were you, were you, are you listening to Pandora? Is it something running in the background? How recently uh, were, were you touching the screen? These are all uh, important things to help determine what's actually going on. Uh, to be a little more specific, here's some of the actual sensors we're looking at. We've already discussed most of them. Uh, web content here, uh, the, the weather, news, and stocks. We're using uh, Google secret APIs, I guess, for these. Uh, I say secret because they're not documented. Uh, and uh, largely just to download only for, the, for, the, for those web services. And then also for the social media, we're, we're uh, looking at kind of two-way automation here. So in addition to being able to check your, uh, you know, your friends' feeds and such, and you know, tweets, uh, you can actually automate your own phone to respond to those under certain conditions. So if I'm doing you know, certain activities, I maybe want to set it to tweet my locations, or to uh, maybe uh, if, we're, if we can identify people who are sick, we can use their social networks and uh, avoid this person because they're probably going to <laughs> stay away. <laughs> okay, so what is really what is this really good for? Um, well, context itself is really largely to dis disambiguate situations and to optimize performance. Uh, when we have information available ahead of time, we can prune search spaces and do a lot more efficient uh, computation with some of this information. Uh, some industries that are interested here, healthcare and medicine, obviously, a lot of the stuff we've done with B uh, is in medical monitoring, and a lot of the stuff means different things in different contexts. Uh, for example, the heart rate. If your heart rate is increasing, well, there's tons of reasons why your heart rate is increasing. Maybe you're watching a scary movie. Yes, I'm going to show you at a movie theater. That's how you do that. Maybe you're exercising. Um, or maybe you're having a heart attack. <laughs> well, if, if we can determine all of these things, uh, this context means a lot. It's useful for stuff. Uh, some other interesting stuff, media and advertising. Uh, we, already, we already get location-based ads, so why not context-based ads? Get certain ads while you're, or while you're exercising, certain ads while you're in traffic. Uh, you know, advertisers can pay extra money for this to include certain periods or exclude certain periods. Maybe McDonald's doesn't want to give you an ad when you're sitting in traffic. That'll give you a negative opinion of McDonald's. Uh, so pay extra. Uh, also, law enforcement, uh, things, facial recognition, context. If this is something that actually would be large term deployed, um, you know, it can help solve problems. Okay, so a little bit of implementation is details. Uh, I call it a context provider, which is largely just an extension of the Android content provider. Uh, this is necessary because of the way Android is designed. Uh, Android applications run uh, in their own sandboxes, I guess, uh, in their own in instances of the Dalvik, Dalvik virtual machine, uh, which is in turn in their own Linux processes. So this, uh, this is largely for security uh, and, and to uh, prevent apps from misbehaving. Uh, so to make them communicate, largely we use uh, content providers, which are basically structures that uh, allow uh, applications to communicate and store data in places that allow it to be accessible to other applications, um, since the APKs are you know, sandbox. Uh, it uh, provides a accessible URI uh, resource. Basically, this is how we uh, get the context provider and how we are able to get the information. Uh, some benefits of doing it this way that we've, we've come up with uh, is easing maintenance, updates, and querying. Uh, a lot of this is, uh, if, if multiple applications are interested in this information, they would normally have to uh, calculate this all individually, and that's redundant and waste. So doing it this way uh, also keeps consistency and things like that too. Okay, so now we move on to BioAware, which is sort of the next uh, evolution of context. So uh, taking this context system that we're having with additional bio, bio sensors, uh, like heart rates and pulse oximeters, and uh, there's a whole bunch of new exotic stuff coming out, even Bluetooth pills you can take that give you a little indus a little colonoscopy. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, a real, real new class of, uh, of applications that we can create in uh, health, wellness, and entertainment. Uh, the notable example is Beat, the uh, 
uh, framework that Frank and I built, uh, exhibited uh, by Wireless this year, and also Tempo Trainer, a more um, recent project that's uh, looking to uh, really just see what we can do with this technology uh, by uh, taking some of this heart rate data and turning it into an entertainment application to actually drive your music selection based on how hard you're working and how hard you would like to work. Okay, so beat overview, uh, largely, I apologize for the busy slide here. Uh, this was on our uh, conference presentation. Uh, beat itself is a real-time system that uh, actually monitors uh, heart rates from a, um, uh, it's a Zephyr Bluetooth sensor that we have it working with. Uh, we also had a previous version working with a polar sensor, but not too much. Uh, it's basically just a threshold based algorithm. You give it a, you give it a, a the, the area where um, your normal heart rate would be in any conditions above that or below that given where the range is, uh, would trigger an alert. And, um, we use uh, social networks to help minimize um, the false alert rates. And uh, for long term storage and stuff, we're, we're uh, looking at some compression options. Um, though largely it's not really necessary. Um, a lot of what we're finding is that the increasing capabilities of the phone, it's no problem to store this data. Without compression. And uh, because Android's so open source and we get access to a lot of the system code, it's actually quite easy to uh, incorporate new devices. Well, easier to incorporate new devices. Uh, here's uh, I guess everything needs some screenshots. So here's uh, some screenshot of how we add uh, different things to the Beat framework here. Uh, these uh, arrows in here will actually, you can't see here. these arrows here are actually going to generate, will uh, show the trend uh, of points as they're being posted along. Uh, it also has some points to, uh, to jump around to, some other apps that we're using here, um, like Calendar View for long-term data stuff, um, and then also some graphs and things. Um, you can see here. So here's a nice, uh, pretty little graph of uh, what the Beat uh, Grapher can do. This is uh, looking at longer-term stored data over time periods. Uh, it's scrollable and doable. Uh, you can see these dotted lines here that are actually uh, showing the direction and magnitude of trend. Uh, this is. Uh, isn't really necessarily related to the context stuff. This was kind of the project that we had first and really evolved into this sort of uh, large model. Uh, so into the alert escalation. Uh, this is largely from uh, Frank's iFall project. It actually is entirely from that. Uh, basically, the, the, uh, the idea is we use the Google, uh, Google Voice and social networking to eliminate false positives. So in the, in the event of alert in emergency condition, uh, we first present the user with an option to dismiss it. If they do not, we assume that the, uh, it is a genuine alert and continues to the next level of escalation, in which case we will contact their designated social contact who will determine whether or not there really is an emergency. And if there is, we can get things like their GPS location and get help from them. Uh, and largely, this reason for this uh, kind of multi-level tier is to, is to eliminate the false positives. Uh, as far as evaluation goes, currently we've really done some uh, data storage, network overhead, also some power overhead. Uh, as far as real uh, data with people, it's kind of harder to come by. Uh, currently in the process of getting human subjects to study uh, for this. I, if anyone's ever done that, it's not easy to finish all of that. Uh, hopefully um, all the paperwork is completed now and we can uh, move forward with that soon. Uh, here's kind of the storage overhead. Uh, largely, this, this can be uh, summarized into uh, it doesn't require that much storage, uh, and especially because of the, the rates that we're getting with phones right now. I mean, with uh, you know we have eight, eight 16 gigs uh, of flash available in addition before we can start to talk about cell, uh, SD cards. And also, since this is a medical monitoring application, largely this data will be uploaded to some sort of a medical provider who cares about it. So, uh, largely not an issue. And also, as we as we start to distill this into more higher level context information, it's going to require even less storage. Okay, uh, moving on to Tempo Trainer. This is uh, this is the fun project, I guess. It's an alternative music player and recommendation system. Uh, so, a quick summary. Six oh, minutes. <laughs> Uh, okay, so uh, largely uh, this, this program will take uh, all of the music that you have on your phone, it will uh, perform some calculations, determine the beats per minute of them, and then paired with uh, a, some target heart rate information where you want your, to be exercising in, basically. Uh, it will provide uh, a recommendation of songs that you have that fit in those range. So if you're below where, you're, where you want your target heart rate to be, you, your phone will progressively play faster songs to motivate you to work harder. And, uh, also goes both ways. If you're Above where you should be, slower songs will bring you down. Uh, 
here's the, kind of the interface here. It's pretty simple. Uh, it's driven from the Music Cube project. Uh, rather than having kind of a traditional Android kind of interface where you have a lot of uh, little buttons, graphic art, this is more for, uh, for an exercise application. You're going to be less concerned about that. It's real quick. Let me just quickly get what I need here. Uh, so this, uh, this interface uh, lets you see the next few songs in a row. You can throw them off if you don't want them, reorganize them, et cetera. Uh, BPM calculation, I tried a bunch of different ways here. Um, they all have, I guess, uh, benefits and, and drawbacks here. Uh, largely, we first tried with external tools. Uh, BPM DJ is the, one of the best open source examples of this. There's also a lot of plugins for things like iTunes and uh, Linux and stuff for those people. Uh, web services, these are pretty interesting. Um, it's probably where the final release will actually come from. Uh, Equinest, these are services that maintain large databases of music metadata, and you can um, effectively send a hash of the song, and it will compare it. You know, it's probabilistically which song is uh, and including uh, external metadata. Like, uh, and stuff. Uh, other options that we looked at, local process on the phone. This is really expensive. Um, the successful example takes, uh, it's about five minutes a song to calculate, so really, not really that feasible. Uh, also looked into some creative opportunities. Tap into the beats, this is what I like. So we'll actually play the song uh, out and you actually will tap along to capture the beats. Right? <laughs> so kind, of a, kind of an interesting, fun way to make it a game. Into, uh, uh, future work here, uh, looking into some long-term analysis of this con contextual combinations, uh, maybe some decision tree regression kind of stuff, trying to determine what is the, uh, the normal conditions, what are, uh, what are normal, what, what should you be doing in certain contexts, right? certain periods of the day. Uh, also to uh, tie into alert to those anomalous conditions. Um, if they're, uh, and then also to complete the human subject study to also get some uh, more reliable data on false positives. And that is largely it. So questions? Right now all the, all the data is on the phone? Yes. Or, and so you have no way of uploading it or Taking it off of there, or this for as far as what the uh, like the like the graphs that you had, right? Oh that yeah, like uh, well, from using the, uh, the the sharing API, so we can send it by email, Facebook, and stuff right now. Okay. But just I mean, obviously this is gonna for this being medical data, you know, paper, reg paper regulations and stuff that won't be an option. Right. For the actual data. So definitely something. So um, whenever you start data mining a, a new area, uh, eventually you start to realize, wow, there's a lot of information that you can get that you would not really have expected you could know. Um, did you, do you have in place or do you plan to have in place any systems for um, permissions, particularly when you start getting into a large amount of con context um, provision um, to be able to allow a user to decide, well, at what levels or what kinds of data mined nodes you would provide? Um, uh, or is it, you know, instead of just being, you know, well, you either install our app or you don't? Uh, well, actually, no. Incidentally, that's actually into another uh, area we're looking at, um, looking into actually finer grain um, differentiation of, of, of uh, permissions and such. Uh, we were kind of looking into that um, previously. Uh, yeah, so it, it's certainly something that needs to be done. Uh, we'll definitely. But as far as anything we've uh, I've done related to that. Uh, I've used decision tree regression previously to do some stuff. And that will be where I'll go with. All right, let's give our presenter a round of applause. <laughs>